The average flight sim user who's been around for a while, such as myself, might sometimes be heard referring to a golden age of flight simulation with varying years for when this time frame actually is. I've heard of anywhere from 1985 to 2015 and all points in between, but I would personally argue this golden age is actually about 2000 to 2006. However, anyone using the words golden age when describing flight simulation would probably agree that said age could not possibly be complete without one of the coolest add-on aircraft ever made, Dreamfleet's Boeing 727, part of their greatest airliner series and the website preview page shown here. I still very regularly take this one out of the hangar and with good reason, it's just dang fun. Even to this day, more than a decade and a half after its last updates were released, which is the mark of a truly timeless add-on. The team members behind the Dreamfleet product pages are among the old legends when referring to flight sim add-on development, and many of them deserve entire videos of their own celebrating their accomplishments. Over the years, Dreamfleet published several aircraft under their name for various versions of Flight Sim, and members of their team have credits in everything from freeware publishing, such as the Historic Jetliners Group, to other legendary payware add-ons, such as the Flight 1 ATR-72. Another popular product of theirs was the Boeing 737-400, released for Flight Sim 2000 and Flight Sim 2002, which was among the most complex of add-ons that you could buy when it was released in 2001. The original version 1 of the 727 was published in late 2004 after a three-year development cycle, and version 2 was published the day before New Year's Eve in 2005. The differences between versions 1 and version 2 aren't as substantial as many of the quote version 2 products that tend to come out these days, but that's not to downplay the fact that they went out of their way to program a number of fixes and improvements and then charge nothing at all to upgrade for existing users. A far cry from some of today's add-on developers. Most of the changes and improvements come in the form of several additional new models, such as the Winglet equipped 727s and the Super 27, as well as a bunch of new additional liveries, tweaks to the way the systems work, and improvements to the overall aerodynamics, as well as several other more minor changes. The Dreamfleet 727 comes to us in a time when flight simulation as a hobby was advancing rapidly thanks to the ever-increasing detail and accuracy of the aircraft being made at the time. The early to mid-2000s is marked by an exponential increase in the number of complex, high-level add-ons being released, with better and better graphics and an ever-increasing level of systems depth. A few months before the release of their 737-400 in late 2001, Dreamfleet founder Lou Betty gave the go-ahead to begin moving resources for development towards their next product. Lou originally wanted to develop a 707, but there was concern that the market for such an add-on would not be substantial enough to recover the development costs. In August of 2001, an online poll was held to determine which product should be created next, and a decision was agreed upon after the Boeing 727 seemingly won by a fair margin, though the actual poll results seemed to have been lost to time, at least as far as I could find. With the voice of the flight simmer crowd being loud and clear, development began on the 727, borrowing many development techniques and resources from their 737 along the way. Finally, in December of 2004, version 1 of the 727 was officially released to critical acclaim. A Boeing 707 made by Dreamfleet would never see the light of day, and the same fate would befall a number of airliner projects that the company and its team members attempted to make. All of these that you see on screen were officially announced or even partway through development by Dreamfleet when they were cancelled for various reasons. A darn shame, if you ask me, as any one of these would have probably been brilliant. Anyway, now that we know the backstory, let's see what you actually get when you buy the Dreamfleet 727. During the making of this video, I actually found a boxed copy of the 727, but coming from overseas, it won't arrive until after this video is completed. From what I gather, the box version is nothing too special, only being a small plastic box containing a simple black and white manual and the disc itself, with not much more to see. Installation of the download version of the 727 is accomplished through the Flight One wrapper system. Flight One's wrapper system is simple and easy to use, with the ability to purchase, download, or even reinstall the product all built into a simple and secure interface. Enter your information to either purchase or reinstall, and the wrapper will automatically download and then run the installer for the 727. It also places a file on your hard drive that lets an internal checker know that you are too legitimate to quit it. 
The Dreamfleet 727 installer itself is very quick and easy, essentially just click next until the installer is finished and you're all set. Uh, well, mostly that is. There is some housekeeping that you should do before firing up your new tube liner for the first time, which comes in the form of starting up the included configuration manager. Before I talk directly about the configuration manager, it's important to note that I have occasionally run into various errors trying to start the manager, mostly in the form of runtime errors that I guess are related to using Windows 10 rather than Windows XP as the product was originally designed. I've always been able to fix these with a small amount of googling and downloading a file or two, so this isn't really a big deal. Back to the configuration manager, this is a very handy tool with a lot of different functions. Options to change cockpit sound volumes, change the basic equipment configuration of any of the different included models, change the startup configuration of the panels and systems, and change the loadout of the aircraft based on passenger and cargo configurations are just some of the functions afforded to you with this application. When you have your particular aircraft of choice set up just the way you like, simply hit save and then close the manager. At this point, the aircraft is completely set up and ready to go, so we can now start Flight Simulator 2004 and take a look at the 727 up close. Like any other FS-2004 aircraft, upon first loading you'll find yourself in front of the main 2D panel, in this case facing the panel from the left seat. The 2D panel of this aircraft is absolutely beautiful and a work of art for the time, both day and night. On more modern screens it looks a bit dated, but it was originally designed to fit a 4x3 CRT or flat panel display with about 1024x768 being the standard resolution at the time. Back to the panel, the colors are vibrant and correct looking, most of the lights are very apparent and highly visible, and the overall impression is very much that of a living, breathing airliner cockpit. If you can see it on the panel, you can interact with it. The panel comes with a hidden and very useful panel switcher that can be found by flipping this switch guard and then hitting the switch underneath. You can now click any of the intuitive buttons to switch to another panel, and a handily placed click spot on each additional view will bring you to another panel or back to the main captain's view. The click spots themselves are detailed in the included manual, which we will cover later, and become almost second nature or muscle memory to use after a very short time. Much like the captain's panel, each of the other viewpoints retains the same visual quality and clarity, each and every gauge, switch, light, and button made visually distinct and easy to read while also appearing realistic and correctly proportioned. Given the limited screen real estate of the time, this is quite the accomplishment. The panels are also laid out in such a way that they are convenient to use in different phases of flight. For example, starting the engines is a simple operation from the 2D panel thanks to the ability to have the overhead panel, the engine gauges, and the throttle pedestal all visible at the same time. Apart from the interactable windows, there's also the 360-degree two-dimensional views that can be accessed with conveniently placed click spots as well, allowing you to simply click your way around everything viewable outside of the windows as well as behind you. The 2D side views themselves are quite crisp and free of jagged edges, and even have the actual 2D panel instrumentation superimposed over them. Even though the flight instruments shown in the 2D view look distinctly different from the other parts of the cockpit that are obviously taken from a real-life photo of the aircraft, it still does a lot to make the whole 2D panel feel a lot more cohesive, and I like it. Some additional features of the panel include exterior wing views taken from the passenger's perspective, the inclusion of the captain's and first officer's perspectives of the main 2D panel, and approach viewpoints for both, though this is hardly more than a small adjustment of the viewpoint upward. Also, there's a fully functional weather radar, which is actually the Reality XP weather radar bundled into the 727 completely for free, a whole separate product normally worth $24.95 US dollars. I'd also just like to point out that I really love the fact that the main panels are nearly centered on the ADI and HSI gauges, just as you would be if you were sitting in front of the real thing. A very nice touch that is so subtle and realistic that you hardly even notice it until it's been pointed out to you, as most aircraft panels made for Flight Simulator just don't do this. Overall, I'd have to say this is one of the greatest two-dimensional panels ever made, and it holds up remarkably well for its age. Wear and tear marks, photorealistic views, smooth, accurate, and readable instrumentation, 
and easy navigation and use of the various viewpoints all combine together to make 2D panel flying easy and fun. Moving on from the 2D panel, Dreamfleet has also included a three-dimensional virtual cockpit in their Boeing 727 and it, too, is absolutely amazing for the time. The whole virtual cockpit model quite easily gives the impression of the cramped and completely utilitarian workspace that the 727 was known by its pilots for. The whole flight deck is modeled exceptionally by early 2000s standards, with most of the major 3D components prominently protruding past their places on the panel, and the complete shape of the flight deck truly captures the early Boeing-style windows and general layout flawlessly. There's even some fun details littered about, such as the oxygen masks hanging down from the ceiling, and an operating handbook lying on the engineer's desk. Working windshield wipers wipe wet windows where the rain wanders, one of the first add-ons that I can recall including such a feature. The texture work on the 3D interior model is very good in almost all places, and the visual quality and clarity is on par with or even exceeds most other contemporary expansions. My only complaints with the texturing in the 3D cockpit come in the form of alpha mapping, or in other words, reflections. The clipboard attached to the yoke is the most egregious of these examples, looking quite horrible in flight as the reflections move and twist in weird ways across the face. The rudder pedals and a couple of other places in the 3D cockpit also have this texturing applied. This can be fixed quite easily if you happen to know how to work with bitmaps textures, but I think it's quite annoying and I just don't understand why it was chosen by the designer. The gauges used in the virtual cockpit are basically just copy-pasted from the 2D panel, and I have no problem with that. The gauges look just as good in the 3D cockpit as they do the 2D one. In 2004, it was quite remarkable to have gauges that refreshed fast enough to be usable without hurting frame rates too badly in the 3D cockpit. What's more, everything except for the engineer's panel can be interacted with in the 3D cockpit. In other words, except for the engineer's station, the airplane can be flown entirely by the virtual flight deck if you so choose. This was quite the novelty back when the 727 was released, as fully interactive 3D cockpits were a brand new invention in the world of Microsoft Flight Simulator. The virtual cockpit is really all that's included with the 3D interior model. There's no virtual cabin here. However, it is notable that they included a large portion of the exterior of the airplane around the cockpit, as well as the wings. So if you happen to have a camera add-on, or perhaps track IR, you can really get up close to the windows and see everything that the pilots would see. There's also options within the included configuration manager to help with performance in the event that the virtual cockpit is just too hard on your system, or you can even outright disable the 3D cockpit entirely to save on RAM and computing power if you know you won't be using it. I really do love the Dreamfleet 727's 3D flight deck. Even despite its age and the occasional bit of graphical weirdness, I still find that suspending my disbelief and finding myself feeling like I'm actually in the cockpit flying is fantastically easy to do. And I think that says everything that need be said about the experience that Dreamfleet has crafted. From here, let's walk down the jet bridge stairway and see what the aircraft looks like from the outside. The exterior model is awesome. Overall, the initial size and shape of the 727 is perfectly represented, and there's nothing that sticks out right away as being strange or incorrect. Every part of the aircraft that requires definition is well represented, and by early 2000s standards, there's an exceedingly high amount of eye candy to explore. Some examples of this beautiful modeling are the inclusion of the slat actuators, as well as the flap jack screws, the landing gear trucks and associated compression, the tail skid and rear stairwell, and of course all of the fully moving flight control surfaces, including the massive rudder balance tabs. I only have a few minor complaints about the exterior modeling as a whole. The most important, I think, being the shaping of the wing, especially at the wing root. Notice how the real aircraft has a very sharp leading edge profile on the wing, especially right where it joins the fuselage as compared to the simulated aircraft. And also note that it has a flatter bottom section just behind the nose of the leading edge of the wing going out across the wing. The end result is that the Kruger flaps, the extended portions of the wing shown in both images, appear much more curved on the simulated aircraft than they do on the real one, in which they appear quite flat. I also think that the shape of the leading edge slats is a bit poor too. The only other nitpick I have is this strange polygon looking down engine 2. 
This area should be open to the front of the engine itself. I have no problem with not modeling the engine because back there it really can't be seen from any normal angle outside the airplane, but I think that the inlet could have been extended at least a little bit further back such that this polygon wouldn't be visible. The textures included with the 727 are also quite good. The model itself has very good resolution on its textures for the time, and there's a lot of small details to see all over the airplane. The different air carrier liveries are also well represented, and all of them look fantastic. My only complaint is that some of the colors are a touch off, but that really is nitpicking. The textures themselves are not hilariously overworked with dirt, grime, and shine, as is so common in other flight sim liveries, and even the bare metal textures tend to look pretty good with just the right mix of base color and alpha channel reflection. The aircraft illuminates just as nicely at night, with some very detailed hard work put into the light splash textures. Dreamfleet included their own nightlight effects on the wingtips, which look okay, though I'm not particularly impressed by them. What does impress me slightly is the inclusion of a very subtle wing illumination light effect on the aircraft itself, a nice and not so common touch for the time. The cabin lights glow with a soft yellow overtone mixed with the images of passengers in the cabin and their seats. Very atmospheric, and I love it. Speaking of textures, you can create your own in fairly quick and easy fashion thanks to this product being made compatible with Flight 1's Textomatic or TOM add-on. Simply dress up your aircraft the way you'd like using a graphics editor such as Photoshop or GIMP, export to the right folder, and then let Tom take care of the rest for you. Dreamfleet has made an aircraft that is a joy to look at from the outside, and I've probably spent just as much time in the cockpit flying as I have outside of it admiring the 727's gorgeous form. At this point, I think we'll begin exploring an often underrated and underappreciated part of add-on aircraft. Sound and sound engineering in Flight Simulator is unfortunately very commonly overlooked by both designers and users alike. However, much like it doesn't take a chef to know when the food is bad, most users can tell when there's bad sound design. A great aircraft can be absolutely killed by bad sound design. Sounds are so important in aviation, especially in Flight Simulator, to aid in immersion, because listening is one of the two primary senses that we engage when we simulate flight, the other being sight. Dreamfleet's team has created a highly customized soundscape for us users to enjoy. Here's some various examples from the flight deck for your listening pleasure. Glide slope. Pull up. Wind shear. Wind shear. Wind shear. Dreamfleet has really captured the feel of the 727 with their custom sounds. The sound of the wind against the cockpit windows, the nearly inaudible engines from the flight deck, and nearly 70 other custom sounds really make for an awesome experience with headphones. The custom flight deck sounds are fully adjustable in volume too, allowing you to even outright disable any sounds you don't want. I did this with the nose wheel braking sound because most airlines either didn't have this option or deactivated it very shortly into its life. Many of the sounds have a dated quality to them, and that's to be expected. They don't necessarily sound any better nor worse than other contemporary add-ons in my opinion. Some of the choices for the sounds are questionable at best though, uh, take a listen to some of these. The landing gear lever makes this weird sound like it's made out of a baby's rattler toy or something. Gear down. The autopilot disconnect warning is more akin to a modern Airbus than an older Boeing. And the windshield wiper sounds like it's about to blow its motor. 
The actual sounds themselves aren't bad, but they don't really make me think of the things they're supposed to represent. You can replace them relatively easily, provided you have a sound you'd like to replace them with, as almost all of the custom sounds are located in the main Flight Sim sound directory as simple WAV files. Anyway, let's now step out onto the ramp and hear the roar of the JT-8D engines. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, Dreamfleet chose not to include any engine startup sounds in the exterior view. I guess they never anticipated somebody standing outside the aircraft to listen to the engine start. I really wish that they would have though, because it's a very cool sound to hear in person. The engine sounds in this package are fantastic, and truly capture the roaring power of the 727's low-bypass turbofans, though I can't help feeling like there's a little something to be desired with how truly loud they can be. Take a listen to the historic Jetliners group Boeing 727 engine sounds, and I think you'll understand what I mean. Don't get me wrong, I love both of these sound packs in their own unique ways, and I personally think a mix of the two could be a holy grail of sorts for 727 engine noise, but I'm not familiar enough with sound configuration files to really make that happen myself. I give the Dreamfleet 727 very high ratings for its sound design overall. My only criticisms are hardly more than nitpicks, and the whole thing just sounds great, especially for the time. So how does everything we've seen come together so far? Let's examine the depth of the systems included within the cockpit. I'll try to keep this section short, because it would be very easy to get lost in a lot of techno babble and jargon that just is not very interesting to listen to. Instead, I highly recommend you explore the systems and the included manual yourself if you're interested in how the 727 systems work. If you're any good at reading in between the lines, you'll know that what I just said is some pretty high praise. The Dreamfleet 727 boasts some seriously in-depth and impressive systems implementation. I wouldn't call it study level, as the systems aren't 100% implemented, but I would say that they are implemented to a high enough level that most real 727 pilots and engineers would be satisfied with normal operations at the least. A fully functional APU, a working automatic or manual pressurization system, fuel cross-feeding, and many more systems await you when you step into the Dreamfleet 727. Remember, always protect essential. Okay, now that we've seen and heard everything the 727 has to offer, let's analyze its handling characteristics and how it flies. There's a lot I can say about a lot of different things, and to spare you the long version, I'll just say this. I have never seen a flight model made for Flight Simulator that accurately simulates any type of aircraft completely and fully. Not a single one, including the Dreamfleet 727. This is not me being a hater of some kind or trying to intentionally berate someone else's hard work, but rather a genuine objective fact that I can and will prove sometime. The reasons for this are well beyond the scope of this video, and are much more indicative of the flight simulator add-on industry in general than actual faults with the work of any one or set of developers themselves. One day, I will make a video talking about this topic, and it will probably be very long. The elephant in the room about saying this is that the Dreamfleet 727 was tested extensively by real pilots who all vouch for the way it flies, and that's what still makes me believe that the flight dynamics on display here are not bad, they just aren't correct from an objective point of view. Again, a topic for another day. With all of that out of the way, I can safely say that the Dreamfleet 727 has an excellent flight model by Microsoft Flight Simulator add-on standards, and that it has that well-known flight simulator feel of flying on rails and not being too particularly challenging to handle in any given set of conditions. 
I tested this aircraft using the CH Products Flight Sim Yoke, which is a pretty standard feature in most flight sim hobbyist homes. Using plastic yokes based on springs and rubber bands like these, it will always and forever be impossible to accurately capture the feel of flying a heavy jet, and thus it is up to the flight simulator designer to cleverly come up with ways to make the aircraft feel as though it is behaving like a heavy jet. And to this, I must say that Dreamfleet has done a pretty awesome job. The aircraft handles quite easily on the ground, with not too much nor too little momentum. With my default ground friction values modified to more realistic values, the aircraft quite easily taxis and rolls with slightly more than idle thrust at heavy weights. In the air, the 727 behaves like a large, well-mannered old dog. A bit slow, but still responsive and easy to handle. Pitch, roll, and yaw are all sufficient to control the aircraft in all phases of flight, and I never felt like I was pulling my controls to the limits just to get the response I desired. That said, the response feels like it has some real momentum behind it, which helps give that heavy jet impression and really makes flying the 727 by hand a lot of fun. From takeoff to touchdown and any unexpected points in between, the 727 handles gracefully. Dreamfleet has also worked very hard to replicate the performance of the Boeing 727 and I think they've done an incredible job in this department. The aircraft never feels over or underpowered during takeoff, climb, and cruise, and setting the EPR gauges by the performance charts included in the manual will yield some very realistic performance all throughout. My biggest complaint with the Dreamfleet 727's performance is one that's all too common in flight simulator jet airliners. Descents occur at rates much, much faster than the real-life counterparts. According to the performance charts, at about 160,000 pounds, the 727 should be able to descend at about 2,100 or so feet per minute and maintain 280 knots, with engines 1 and 3 set to 56% and engine 2 set to flight idle. As you can see, the aircraft is descending at a much faster rate and still losing speed in this configuration. This is perhaps my biggest complaint overall with the 727 and it's just so frustrating because it makes descent planning very challenging. Flap extension and retraction creates a notable pitch down moment, which must be counteracted with trim accordingly, just as in the real aircraft. Overall, I'd say that Dreamfleet has done a pretty great job with the flight model, even despite my criticisms. I really wish that it didn't suffer from so many of the same problems that a bunch of other flight models made for flight simulators suffer from, but for what it is, it's pretty great. So what's left at this point? Well, Dreamfleet was also kind enough to create a very thorough set of manuals describing how to operate and fly the 727 in every way imaginable. Normal procedures, performance charts, detailed images and explanations of all the systems, and even a tutorial flight are all stuffed into over 400 pages of content to explore if you need something to read while going number two. The manuals are all crafted by hand rather than being direct copies of actual manufacturer's documents and are chock full of images and schematics to help illustrate the systems and operations. The included tutorial flight walks you through every step of operating the 727, from initial planning to shut down at the gate, with plenty of images illustrating flow patterns and which checklist to run at what time. And that, as they say, is that. The Dreamfleet 727 is an incredible and fully complete package that is 100% deserving of the praise it received when it was first published, and it holds up incredibly well more than 15 years since it was last updated. If you still find yourself toying around with Flight Simulator 2004 like I do, and have an interest in high-level aircraft, do yourself a favor and add the Dreamfleet 727 to your collection if you haven't already. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you really liked this video and you want to see more, don't worry, I'll be posting more in the future, so stay tuned.